You master technique first, and then you can forget about it. But you can't forget about something you've never learned. You have to learn it first. If you think it's important enough to do, you'll find a way to do it. If you can't find a way to do it, it means it's not important, and you should recognize that and not make any excuse about it. The very act of sticking with something and not giving up is precisely the thing. That's the training. It's not the getting good at it. It's the sticking to it and never giving up. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Inside Look podcast. Today we're speaking with Earl Hartman Sensei from Palo Alto, California, USA. Hartman Sensei has been training for nearly 50 years and has experience in Kendo, Iaido, Jo, and Nagao Ryu. Hartman Sensei's primary martial art is Kudo, where he holds the rank of Renchi Sixtan from the All Japan Kudo Federation and studied Kudo with the late Urakami Hiroko Sensei, the first and only woman Hanshi Tenth Dan. In the Kudo Renmei. In this episode, he shares many fun and interesting stories from his personal experience, as well as those of famous Kudo Sensei in history. I really enjoyed this conversation with Earl Hartman Sensei, and I hope you will too. Please enjoy. I'm from、uh, Berkeley, California, and that's the San Francisco Bay Area. So, for as long as I can remember, the Asian component of the local culture was always very strong. And my best friend in elementary school was this Japanese American guy. His name was Steve Shimada, and then there was Ken Nakamura and Gary Nishida and Stan Sugimoto, and all of these people that were just my friends in school. So there was always this Asian culture thing going on for as long as as I can remember, and so. I always had an interest, and I can't remember exactly which came first, but. My father found an ad in the paper for the Japanese American Festival in Concord, which is a town not too far from where I live. And so they were having taiko drumming and martial arts demonstrations, and I thought that sounded really cool. I think I was seventeen, sixteen, or seventeen at the time. So we went out there to see it, and there was a kendo demonstration, and it was just simply the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. And I thought I have got to learn how to do this. It's just so awesome, and so I got the cheapest set of kendo gear I could find, and was down at the Oakland Buddhist Church the next week and started doing kendo. So I was doing kendo twice a week for like about three years, I guess. And at one point, our dojo was visited by a, a very high-ranking police instructor who apparently was sent by Japan to travel around the U.S. and Canada to check out the dojos and the kendo situation in America. I mean, I had no idea who this guy was, and so I thought that I would ask him to help me out because I wanted to go to Japan for what I thought was going to be like six months to do kendo. And I'm here, I am, you know, I'm doing kendo twice a week, you know. I'm really, really practicing hard. I'm ready for this. And I figured he'd like, yeah, yeah, sure, kid. Here, here's a couple of phone numbers. Here, you know, call these guys. But like, he set up this whole living situation for me. I didn't realize, knowing nothing about Japan. At all, expect this kind of hands-on care. I expected him to do like what any American would do: would give me a couple numbers to call and let me figure it out. So before I knew it, I was ensconced in Kanazawa, the capital of Ishikawa Prefecture. And the only reason I wound up there was completely random. I asked some Japanese guy in our kendo class if he had any suggestions about where I should live, and I told him I wanted to live in a traditional historical town, not a big Huge urban area like Tokyo, and, he, and so he said, "I've heard that Kanazawa is nice." But he'd never been there, but he'd heard that it was nice.、Yes. I had studied Japanese for about a year in a university course at, at Cal Berkeley, and of course, you know, when I got off the boat, and it was a boat, by the way. This is the other thing: is I traveled to Japan with my sister, who went to Kyoto to live with friends for a while, while I went off to Kanazawa. But we went by ship. Because it was, interestingly enough, at that time, this is 1972, it was still cheaper than going by plane. So we took one of the last voyages of the President Line. I can't remember the name of the ship, and I think these ships were eventually converted into freighters afterward when this kind of travel became simply uneconomical. So、uh, that's how I started: kendo in the morning, kudo in the afternoon, yai twice a week. Living in a tiny little room, it cost me like a hundred dollars a month in rent. <laughs> so that's how I wound up in Kanazawa, and it completely changed my life. I mean, completely changed my life. 
So before I knew it, I was practicing kendo every day. I mean, every day. So from nine in the morning to noon, I was getting beaten up by the riot squad police. And I felt like I'd been put into a meat grinder. I mean, I was not prepared for it. The weakest guy in the squad was a Sandan, and I had no rank at all. I was not physically or mentally or psychologically or emotionally prepared for this kind of what I thought was really strenuous practice. And these guys, for six months out of the year, they did kendo six hours a day, three hours in the morning and then three hours in the afternoon. And all they did was basically just beat each other up for six hours a day. Just incredibly intense practice. A lot of screaming, a lot of leg trips, a lot of leg sweeps, a lot of wrestling. If you lost your shinai, nobody backed off and said, well, wait a minute, let me pick up my sword. <laughs> if they knocked the shinai out of your hands, they would just attack you. and You would have to protect yourself in any way you could, and they often wound up wrestling on the floor. Or... Since I didn't grow up practicing football or boxing, this, this level of violence was really quite new to me. But I didn't want to quit because then everyone would say, oh, yeah, the American's a quitter. So I stuck it out for a year and a half, and I got halfway decent at it. But I was scared, really scared most of the time, because these guys really meant business. I saw a couple of guys knocked out, hit the back of their head on the floor, and just out like a light. You know? So, yeah, for me it was intense. And, but uh, what I did was is that I would practice kendo in the morning eat lunch, and then go to Kudo in the afternoon, and then teach just enough English so I wouldn't starve to death. And then I did EI twice a week. How did you get started with Iaido and Kudo? Well, I'd always, I had always, ever since I can remember, like bows and arrows. And my parents started getting interested in Zen Buddhism when I was like about 16. And there was this famous book, you know, Zen and the Art of Archery by Eugen Haribo, and I read it. And I also read Suzuki's book, Zen and Japanese Culture or something. And so, I mean, I figured I had the deep inside knowledge. You know. And so when you read Haribo's book, you know, he describes Kudo as being basically like magic. You stand there, you don't think about anything, you don't think about aiming, all you do is unite with the void, and then, hey, presto, by magic, but you're going to hit the target. And being an 18-year-old kid, who wouldn't want to learn how to do that? And so I had already planned to start doing Kudo when I went to Japan to begin with. So very shortly after I got set up in my Kendo practice, we went out and talked to the local Kudo teacher. And so I started pretty much right away. So I did that for a year and a half. Came back, stayed in America for two years, then went back to Japan and wound up staying for another eight years pursuing Kudo mainly on my second stint. A couple of questions. Sure. You, you originally said that your plan was to go there for six months. It ended up being a year and a half. How did that happen? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, I didn't want to stop halfway through. I mean, I, I just decided to stay. That's all. In spite of the fact that I found Kendo practice very hard and very taxing, I was enjoying myself. I mean, I, I thought I was doing something of value. I certainly enjoyed my Kudo and my EI and everything. I just didn't want to quit halfway through. I wanted to actually get something out of it. But then I just sort of suddenly got homesick and decided to go back. So I married a woman that I had met in kendo class, actually. My introduction to her was, like, I'm out on the floor, and somebody said to the woman who became my wife, you can't got me, go out and fight this guy. And so I'm confronted with this five-foot-tall, screaming banshee of a woman who was just like the Tasmanian devil. She ran at me just like shrieking at the top of her lungs, attacking me relentlessly. And uh, things haven't changed over all these years. <laughs> what was this tournament? Was it a police? It wasn't a tournament. It was just regular practice. So basically, the, the police would practice by themselves Monday through Friday. And then Sunday was like a regular general practice with everybody. And my wife was kind of like the police mascot. Because she was kendo kichi guy, you know, she was just crazy for kendo. And I, I, I think I actually met her when I started doing EI, because she was doing EI with the same teacher. And my EI teacher, I need to mention, was named Masaoka Kazumi. He was about 72 or 73 at the time, and he was the last Menkyo Kaiden holder from Oe Masanishi. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was like a super big deal. I went with him to the Kyoto tournament that they have every year you know, during Golden Week, and he was the last guy to perform. 
he was that big. But he died a little less than a year after I started doing the eye with him. He died in the middle of a kendo practice. Either he had a heart attack or a stroke or something, I don't know. I met my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time, but I met her at our regular coffee shop, and she told me that he died yesterday. I just couldn't believe it. He was at a kendo practice. He was practicing with some high school kid, just being the hitting dummy. And then so they finished practice. He went back to his place, sat down, took off his kote and men, and then just peeled over died on the spot. That's one of my kendo stories. He was practicing kendo with the right... No, he, he practiced at a regular dojo and then was teaching the eye twice a week. He didn't practice with the police. He wasn't a member of the police. How did you find him? Because you didn't know that he was a big deal, which means you somehow got connected to him. To yeah, I can't remember too clearly about... But I mean, I guess I must have heard that there was an eye class there. And since there was also swords, you know, and I was into swords. I decided to do that as well. So I started doing that twice a week. But I got a showdown, and I got up through the Tatehizano booth. But after he died, the new sensei started changing stuff, and I really didn't like it. So I kind of lost heart, actually. I didn't really continue with the eye. I mean, I mess around on my own, but I, I've had no formal instruction ever since then, and that's like, gosh, more than 40 years ago now. That's something you commonly hear with martial arts practice. If a sensei that you started with is no longer around, then it's very hard to continue with it. But you've had experience with a lot of quite famous Kudo senseis as well. Maybe you could tell us about your experience yeah. with them. Well, so this is sort of interesting. When I first started doing Kudo, I did the regular Shomen Uchiokoshi that almost everybody does. And I wasn't aware that there was anything other than that. And then I think I was a Yondan at the time. So this must have been in 1970. Sometime between 1976 and 1978, I was in Kanazawa. I was teaching English at a private high school and doing Kudo pretty much all the time. I mean, when I wasn't at the school, I was doing Kudo. So I was probably doing Kudo like four or five hours a day, pretty much every day, shooting more than 100 hours a day. I was, you know, I was young, in decent shape, I guess. So it really wasn't a problem. I can't do that anymore now. Though. So somebody told me that this guy named Murakami sensei was going to be coming up and giving a seminar for instructors. And I wasn't an instructor, but they kind of snuck me into the class. So for the very first time, I saw Shaman Uchiyo Koshi, you know, Hekiryu. And again, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. It, it's like falling in love at first sight with the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. You know, It was just like that. I thought, okay, I have to learn how to shoot that. For the uninitiated, what is the difference between Hekiri Ryu and the showman that everyone does? Right. Well, in the showman Uchiyo Koshi, you grasp the string and set your grip on the bow while the bow is directly in front of you. And then you lift it straight up into the air and then draw it halfway down above your head and then come down into the full draw. So with Hekiryu, is you grasp the string, you catch the bow very slightly to the left to set the grip, and then while the tip of the bow is still on your knee, you draw about one third and then lift the bow above your head. So the interesting thing is that in modern Kudo, 99% or 90, you know, nine out of 10 people do the Shomen Uchiyo Koshi. It's almost completely universal. But the interesting thing is that up until the end of the Second World War, the situation was completely reversed. Most people did some version of Hekiyu. There are a number of different branches. There's the Hekiryu Insai Ha, which is what I do, Go Setsu Ha, the both Hekiryu Sekka Ha. Then there's the Bishu and Kishu Chikurin schools, which are also kind of shaman, but oh, they're a little bit different. But those were all associated with the Butokukai, the Dainik Bontekoku, you know, Butokukai, which was uh, abolished after the war by the Americans. So my understanding is that the Student Kudo Association, which were heavily influenced by the showman school, the Hondaryu basically, were sort of left alone. And so basically, post-war, the showman Uchiyo Koshi became the mainstream way of doing things, especially under the only Nippon Kudo Federation. And so the Heki schools are definitely in the minority now. What gave you that love at first sight feeling? What did you see? It was just very martial. It was like, it's hard to explain. You know, it's a matter of taste, I guess. For me, Budo means business. My training in Kendo is basically, it's a fight. You have to get him before he gets you. There's no messing around. 
it's a deadly serious business. And so when I saw the way the Hickey people approached it, because when you're doing when you're doing Shomen and Chukosha, you lift the bow above your head, you're wide open. If the enemy wants to shoot you, it's, you're like offering yourself as a target. It's very dignified, it's very formal, it's very elegant, but it was the rough and ready business-like feeling, the kind of martial, manly vigor or intensity that I saw in Hekidu that I liked. Because once you draw the bow, before you lift it up, basically, you have the guy. If you consider the target to be an enemy that might be shooting you, once you draw the bow, before you lift it up, not only are you protecting yourself because the bow is between you and the enemy, you can shoot the arrow at any time. And maybe it's just my approach to what I think martial arts are, but this appealed to me. And it seemed very martial, very vigorous. Although I understand the need for reiki and decorum and all of these things in judo, what I dislike about the approach that some people have is that they fetishize the reho, which is not to my taste. This is just a personal quirk, I guess. And so I spoke with him afterwards, and it, it turned out that he was actually a native of Kanazawa. I didn't realize it at the time. He was from there. And so he said, yeah, okay, if you're ever in Tokyo, look me up. So in 1978, I kind of sat down and looked at my life and how things were going and realized that the only saleable skill I really had was a fairly decent Japanese ability. And that if I wanted to make use of that, I really had to learn how to read and write properly because I was illiterate at the time. I mean, I spoke pretty well, but I couldn't read and it seemed lame. So my wife and I decided we were going to go to Tokyo and I was going to teach English while I went to school. My wife was an obstetric nurse and she got a job at a hospital. So for the next three years, I did Kudo while I studied Japanese. And after I completed the Japanese course at the International Division of Sophia University, I started working as a translator. And then I eventually got a job with the Japanese office of an American company and did translating and interpreting for them and continued to do Kudo. So I studied with Murakami Sensei, who was a Hanshi Tenzan, you know, a top guy for about eight years. I took the fifth Don test a number of times but failed miserably. And the idea was I was going to get Godon and then I was going to go back home. But I had two kids and they were like 10 years old, they're twins. And so I realized that if we didn't go back to America soon, they'd never be able to live anywhere but Japan. And I don't know what the situation is now. I've been away for a long time, but at the time there were issues with mixed race children in Japan. First of all, my kids were American citizens. They'd been born in the United States. And even though they looked very Japanese, their name was a foreign name, their citizenship was foreign, I didn't want to force them to be subjected to the kind of treatment that was often meted out to mixed race kids. So we left. I, I really didn't want to leave in a lot of ways, but I thought it was the best. So I was transferred back to the United States, and that was in 1985 when we came back. Now, a few years later, Murakami Sensei passed away. He'd had cancer. I didn't know it at the time. He was a smoker. Most of them were. And he passed away. And then our deal, the deal that we had was that once I got to be fifth on, he was going to teach me Hekidu. And so not being able to pass the test before I came back to the United States was a very big blow. But I had to do what I had to do. So we came back. So you were training with Murakami Sensei for eight years? Yes. Um, and his main thing is Heki to you. So he was able to teach showmen as well. Like what was his thinking around teaching some people one way while he does another way? Well, his feeling was that since I'd started with showmen, I should get to a certain point with showmen. And he felt that once I'd gotten to be fifth on in showmen, that then he would teach me Heki to you. Now, why he thought that way, I don't know. But there does seem to be, on the part of certain people, a certain prejudice against shaman uchiokoshi. I think some people consider it to be too, it kind of reeks of the battlefield a little bit, and people don't like it. The thing is, the way Kido has developed, a lot of things have become kind of mashed together in people's minds. Like a lot of people who don't know anything about Kido at all assume the shaman uchiokoshi comes from the Ogata Wararyu, which simply isn't true. The kind of shaman uchiyo koshi that is done in the All Nippon Kudo Federation is more closely related to Hondaryu, actually. And the Ogasawa Ryu does 
a version of Shaman Ucho Kochi as well. So it's not all one thing or the other. I think the lifting the bow high above the head and then pulling down in one motion probably has a certain connection to Yabusame because that's how the Ogatawara do Yabusame. And so I think it may have crept into it that way. But I've heard a number of differing explanations for why the Shomen Ucho Kochi was adopted because all of the traditional styles are Shaman Ucho Kochi, not Shomen. I can tell you what I've heard if you're interested. Sure, yeah. Okay. I've heard two different stories. I have something that was written by Honda Toshizane, who is considered to be the pioneer of the Shomen Uchiyo Koshi style. He was originally from Wakamas Prefecture. He came to Edo, you know, Tokyo, and he said for the first time that he saw people doing Shomen Uchiyo Koshi, and that he decided to adopt it because he saw it as a more balanced way of doing things and might be better for reasons of physical education or something, because this was the Meiji period when Western ideas were flooding into Japan. And so as I understand it, and again, I have to do a lot more research on this, but it's my understanding that Honda's ideas may have been influenced by Western ideas of physical education, and that the Shomenuchio Koshi method allowed for a more balanced approach to using the left-handed, right-hand side of the body in a more balanced way. And so he said he decided simply to go with the flow and decided to do that. So when I spoke with Usami Sensei about this, he just laughed and said, that's not what happened. And I said, what do you mean? Honda Sensei wrote, I have it in his writing. And so he said to me, Hartman, look, think about it for a minute. Everybody knows that with Shaman Uchi Okoshi, it's much, much easier to set the tenuchi, the grip on the bow, properly. And everybody knows that if you don't have a proper grip on the bow, you're not going to be able to hit anything. So do you honestly think that a traditional shaman Uchiyo Koshi archer is going to throw all of that away just because he saw people doing it this other way or that he had some ideas about physical education? Why would he do that? And I said, no, I don't know. So he said that what really happened was that when... Honda tried teaching Kyudo to city people. They simply weren't physically strong enough to do shaman properly. They were just too weak. So he decided to switch to shaman uchi okoshi because it's easier to do. Even though it's harder to set the tenuchi properly, it's an easier way to draw the bow. So that's why he decided to do it. Now, I have no idea which of these things is correct. And if I weren't so lazy, I would have been researching this more thoroughly for the past number of years. But it's an interesting idea. But I just think there are fashions in things. And Shaman Uchiyo Koshi fell out of favor because it was associated with the, with the Kutokukai, as I understand it. Again, I need to do more research, but that's my understanding at this point. And now pretty much everybody does Shaman Uchiyo Koshi. And having done both, I think that, yes, it is much easier to set the energy properly when you do Shaman. There's no question about that. But the procedure is a little more involved and takes a little more energy per shot. The Shomen Uchiyo Kochi actually is simple. So there's good points and bad points. So Murakami Sensei passed away, and Murakami Hiroko Hansu was the instructor at one of the United States seminars, who actually was uh, Murakami Sensei's sister-in-law, interestingly enough. Just to explain the lineage a bit, there was a very famous Tekidu instructor named Murakami Sakae. And he had a son and a daughter. So his son married Hiroko Sensei, and his daughter married Murakami Sensei. So there was a family connection there. And at the seminar, I went up to her and I said, let me introduce myself. I used to practice with Murakami Sensei when I was in Tokyo. And he said that he would teach me Hekiryu once I got to be fifth dan. And now that I'm fifth dan, he's dead. I'd like to know if you would be willing to teach me Hekiryu. And she said, sure. So ever since then, that's, I guess, more than 25 years ago now, I switched over to Hekiyu and I've been doing it ever since. It sounds like it was pretty simple convincing Urakami-sensei to be your Yes, I was very surprised. This. I was very, very surprised. I don't under understand why it was so simple. I was expecting a lot of pushback. But I want to go on record as saying that she was a wonderful person, a wonderful instructor. And not only that, she was like crackerjack. I actually watched her pass her Hachidan in Kanazawa. I must have been in 1977 or 1978 
you know, they had tests there every now and again, and she came there for the test. And she just looked so good. I mean, she shot better than all of the men put together. And it's really funny. I spoke with her about that later, and she said, you know, I just bought a whole set of traveling luggage that I was planning on using to travel all around Japan, taking my Hachidan test, because normally it takes like 30 times to pass it. So I was expecting I was going to have to be traveling all over the place. And I passed it right away. So I wasted all that money on the luggage. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Before I forget, I do have one funny story, Kudo story, that I heard from Urakami Sakai, who was Urakami Hiroko Sensei's husband, the, the son of Urakami Sakai. His name was Urakami Sunao, and he was Urakami Sakai Sensei's son. And so the way I heard it is that the Butokokai had the Kyoto Taikai every year, and they would have a Kudo portion of it. And apparently, for the very first time, Honda demonstrated his shomen uchiokochi method in public for the first time at this taikai. And afterwards, the teachers called him over and they said, hey, Honda, what is this weird newfangled shomen uchiokochi thing you do? Where'd you get that? And he apparently kind of hemmed and hawed and then went back to his yokan and then checked out in the middle of the night and just split. Because apparently he couldn't say, well, I made it up. After that, he was known as Yonige Honda. Honda who runs away in the middle of the night. Yonige is a thing, yo, evening, nige, nigeru, to run away. So someone who does yonige is that while everybody is asleep, he hightails it out of Dodge so no one can find him. <laughs> so I just thought that was a pretty funny story. Yeah. So continuing with Urakami Sensei, now that she agreed and you were living in the States, what was that interaction? What was that relationship like? Well, going forward? I was traveling back and forth to Japan on business quite frequently. And so when I was there, I would practice with the Urakami Dojo and she would teach me. So that went on for a few years. How was that dojo different than Murakami Sensei's dojo when you were practicing? Well, Murakami Sensei practiced at a publicly run dojo in the part of Tokyo called Nakano. Basically, in, J in Japan, in Tokyo at any rate, each ward of the city has at least one publicly operated dojo, as I understand it. So he was at the one in Nakano. So I would go there pretty much every day, or at least three or four times a week. I was working a regular job at the time. So after work was over, I would go, and then on the weekends, I would. When I, was, when I was in Japan on business, I would go to the Urakami dojo, which was a private dojo, basically just built alongside the house. And so the interesting thing is, is that a lot of the traditional schools like Tekiryu, basically they have their own private organization. And in the case of the Urakami Dojo, it's called the Urakami Domonkai, meaning the brotherhood of the students of Urakami Sakai. Urakami Sakai came to Tokyo with his father when he was like about 10 from a part of Japan called Okayama, which is the center of the Insaiha. And so Urakami Sakai's father, Urakami Naooki, made his living as a Kido teacher. And so he had a, they built a, a small dojo next to their house. The Urakami Domonkai is an organization that's completely separate from the All Nippon Kido Federation. It's a private organization. And it is composed of the students of Urakami Sakai and the people who shoot in his tradition. So at the dojo, everybody shoots Hekiryu, and they also use the Hekiryu Taihai, which is different from the Zen Nippon Kido Renmei Taihai. The Zen Nippon Kido Renmei Taihai is based primarily on the Ogasawara Ryu Taihai, although it's not exactly the same. But the Hekiryu Taihai is completely different, and actually, to me, is much, much more natural, and a lot easier to do, and a much more dynamic and kind of martial arty, so to speak. A quick definition of what Taihai is? I'm sorry, you're right. Taihai refers to the various ceremonial aspects of how to walk properly, how to approach the target, how to sit, how to conduct yourself. Basically, everything that isn't the actual shooting method. So the way people sit in Hekiryu is different, the way they approach the target is different. All, all sorts of things. I'd have to show you, I guess. I far prefer it. It's a lot easier to do. And much less fussy. Members of the Urakami, that private organization, are also members of the Onipon Kido? Yes. So basically, at the Urakami Dojo, almost everybody shoots Hekiryu in Saiha, Shaman Uchiokoshi, and does the Hekiryu Taihai. But they all know how to do the standard Zen Nippon Kido Remei Taihai as well. 
And there are a few members of the Urakami Dojo that do Shomen Uchiho Koshi only. Not very many, but there are a couple. So basically, there are two organizations and they're separate. But everybody in the Urakami Domo Onkai is also a member of the, the All Nippon Kido Federation, and they all participate in All Nippon Kido Federation tournaments and events and tests and everything. So they all know how to do things according to the way the Renme wants, wants them to be done. Oh, so based on your understanding of the Kendo Federation, it's almost like Koryu versus Seitei. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, that's a very good analogy. It's almost exactly like that. Okay. So I want to move from there, from Japan now, back to the States. You started Kido in Japan and you're part of that federation. When you came back, you had to find a place to practice. You had to find an organization. What was that like when you returned right. back to the so States? When I got back here, there were a couple of guys who had been invited by a teacher in Kyushu to learn Kudo. And so they had gone there, came back, and there, there was this kind of an embryonic, like the San Jose Kudo Club. And uh, one of the members had built a little dojo in his backyard, and that's where everybody practiced. So when I got back, that organization was kind of moribund a little bit. But then there was uh, another Japanese woman who was here and so put the Northern California Kudo Federation together over the years. And the All Japan Kudo Federation wanted, each state would have one Renmei. But there was already a pre-existing organization down in Southern California that had been around for quite some time, actually, since the early 1900s in one form or another, mainly a Nikkei organization. So they were already established as the Southern California Kudo Federation, so they were grandfathered in. So California is the only state in the United States that has two Renmei's in it. Everywhere else, it's just one. So over the years, basically, there were some people here and there who had done Kido in Japan, and they'd come back. And so different organizations were started up. There was a, a teacher named Dan DeProspero who lived in Japan for about 10 years and practiced Kido with, who um, was also a very well-known and well-respected Hanshi. And um, they wrote a book together called Kido, the Essence and Practice of Japanese Archery. That's really the best book about Kido in English. There are a number of others, but most of them are kind of the Zen archery variety and really kind of worth it. And so Dan DeProspero became the first president of the organization. And over the years, a number of dojo grew up. So there's dojos in Northern California, Southern California. There used to be one in Indiana, but unfortunately, the sensei there passed away and his wife went back to Japan, so that's no longer there. There's an organization in Minnesota, North Carolina, South Carolina. There's one in Virginia now as well, and I think something in the New York area. But they're a long ways away, and I don't know so much about them. But, uh, you know, America is really a big place, and there's just not that many people, maybe a couple hundred nationwide. And this is only the Remme people. There are other people doing Kudo with the guy Shibata Kanjuro, but they're very much a Zen spiritual path, persuasion. So you came back and you were practicing with the local groups that existed. Can you tell me about how you decided to start your own dojo and circumstances around that and why you named it? Well, I was teaching together with the, the Japanese woman I mentioned, a woman named Yoshiko Buchanan. And it was kind of like oil and water. Our teaching styles just didn't match. It just didn't work out. So we split up and she took her group and I started my own group. It's very small. Maybe I'm just not a good teacher or I don't know how to attract people. Or I've got about seven or eight students. Tell we me rent about a, the name. Oh, the Seishinkan, yeah. Well, this also is really sort of arbitrary. I mean, the dojo that I started with, the Japanese woman was called Shiseikan. And so when I decided to break off, I wanted to have a different name. And so Uchiyama Tozo Sensei, who was one of my Kudo teachers in Japan, came up with the Seishinkan name, the pure dojo, basically. Because it's true that to do Kudo properly, you have to have a certain purity of mind. This doesn't mean what most Westerners think it means. In the West, you know, when people think of purity of mind or, or a pureness of spirit, they seem to be thinking primarily of sexual morality, the Western idea of sin. In other words, if you're without sin, you're pure. And sin in the minds of Christians seems to be primarily concerned with sexual ethics. 
right? If you think about all of the true perfect knight, you know, like Sir Galahad. What was the great thing about Sir Galahad? He never had sex with a woman who was a virgin. That's why he was pure. So I'm not talking about that kind of purity at all. Pure means clear, actually. That is, when you do anything, you have to have a clear mind in the sense that you have to be simply concerned with what you're doing at the moment and not let anything interfere with that. Regret for the past, hope for the future, fear for the future. You have to put all of that out of your mind because if you don't, you simply won't shoot well. So that's what I mean by pure. What it means is that nothing extraneous to what you're doing at the moment should be present in your mind. And I think, as we all know, that that's almost impossible to achieve. But it's also the most important thing when you come right down to that. It's interesting that when you speak of that, it, there's this whole spiritual concept around Kudo. And yet, at the same time, when you're doing Hekiryu, you're attracted to the martial aspect. So when you're thinking about your curriculum or how you teach Kudo to your students, how do you balance those two aspects? Well, first of all, I don't think that there's any contradiction whatsoever. Just because Hekiryu seems more martial than the Kudo Renmei stuff, it's just, it's not true. From a technical aspect, strictly from a technical aspect, from when the bow and arrow was actually a weapon of war and you used it to defend your life, that's just the technical aspect of it. But I think the mental aspect of it is no different. The kind of mental attitude that you need to shoot properly, I don't think that there's really, I don't think there's much difference to be perfectly honest. I mean, when you actually come down to the psychology of the shot, I don't think there's any difference. But this is really a personal thing when you come right down to it. People do keto. I guess perhaps if you would call this a difference between the way I think and the way some other people might think is that I don't think there is in keto anything other than technique. It's all technique. The spiritual aspect or what you might call the psychological aspect is a technique. It's a technique of how you use your mind. Because the main argument I have with the Western approach to things in general is that people conceive of there to be a dichotomy between the quote-unquote spiritual aspect and the physical aspect. And I think this can all be traced back to Haribo's book, which I think did a tremendous disservice to the proper understanding of Kudo in the West. Because Haribo said that it was only spiritual, that the physical aspect was unimportant and that the spiritual insights or growth or whatever that you saw in Kudo could be accomplished without the bow and arrow, which I think is completely and utterly wrong. In every possible way, it's completely wrong. None of this is true. Without the bow, there is no Kudo. So what does that mean? Let me put it this way. If a guy can shoot 100 arrows and hit the target 100 times, which Urakami Sakai was known to be able to do, he knows what he's doing. There is in the Hekiryu a, a saying or a motto called Chu Kang Kyu, meaning strike, pierce, forever. So if the bow and arrow is an implement to accomplish a certain purpose, which is to put an arrow in a target, then what's the important thing? Well, first of all, you have to hit what you're aiming at. If you miss it, it doesn't matter. But if the shot is not powerful enough to penetrate the target, then the fact that you hit it is not important either. So you have to have accuracy and power. And then you have to be able to do that again and again and again and again, right? How does one do that? Well, first of all, one has to have the proper technique of using the implement. It's the same thing with like a chef and his knife. How do you cut things properly? Not only did you have to have a good knife, a really sharp knife, you have to know how to use it. And that means learning technique. If you look at the bow as an implement that's designed to achieve a certain purpose, the very first thing you have to do is learn the technique of how to use it properly. And that's where all the fundamentals come in. So what the Kudo Reme says, how to stand, how to hold the bow, how to lift it, how to draw it. This is all technique. But at the same time, what makes the technique function in the final analysis. It's all the psychological condition of the person who's using the implement. Like whenever you look at somebody like Yo-Yo Ma or Itzhak Perelman or some perfect ballet dancer, everything they do looks effortless, like they're not even thinking about it. But anybody who's done anything knows 
that to achieve that level of mastery requires the most intense, grueling practice over a period of years and decades before you can achieve what looks to us to be completely effortless, right? And so the idea that Herigl put forth that technique is not important, that all you have to do is become one with the force, it's absolute and utter, complete nonsense. None of it is true. You only reach that stage through mastering technique first. You master technique first, and then once you've mastered it, you can forget about it. But you can't forget about something you've never learned. You have to learn it first. And you can only enter the way of Kudo through the technique. There's no other way of doing it. So anybody who does Kudo who disparages the practice of technique does not know what they're talking about. I want to throw two interpretations at you just to see if I got the concept understood. Are we saying that the only way to have the hit, the pierce, and the forever, the consistency, is one way, one way of doing proper technique? Because we, we know that, just like in kendo, you can always hit the target, but do it poorly. Is it that the only way to get the consistency, the forever, is to do it properly? Because if you're just going to go with bad habits, yes, you can hit for a short period of time, but eventually you're going to start missing. That, that, that's it, yeah. The forever part is the hard part. I mean, I've had, you know, everybody's had days where they can't miss. And then you've had days where you can't hit anything. The other question is, again, technique is not something by itself. The technique is executed by the archer. So what allows the archer to do the technique properly? It's the proper frame of mind, the proper attitude, the proper mind. So if the shot doesn't work, well, then you have to say, well, what was wrong? Was it a technical issue or a psychological issue? But the thing is, in the final analysis, regardless of how technically proficient you may be, if you haven't honed your spirit in the right way, your technique is eventually going to betray you if you rely on that alone. So what allows you to execute the technique properly is the frame of mind you're in. You do the mental training via the exercise of technique, because how you do the technique will tell you what your state of mind was. And it works the other way as well. You train in technique by training your mind, because what allows you to do the technique properly is how your mind works. So that's my point, is that there is no dichotomy between technique and spirit, as a lot of Westerners like to think. They're all part of the same package. You can't have one without the other. And the problem I have with a lot of Westerners is that they think that spirit, you know, what's important is basically sort of the attitude they have towards their training. This isn't right either, because you meet all sorts of people who puff themselves up about, how I'm not doing a sport, I'm doing a spiritual practice. And that they think that the fact that they're doing what they consider to be a spiritual practice is somehow more important than how they're actually doing in what they're doing. Like, for example, can you imagine how much everyone would laugh if a person purported to be an expert in playing the violin, but he couldn't play to save his life, but he figured he was a master because of the way he felt about what he was doing? He, he would be laughed out of the park. No one would pay any attention to this person at all they'd see him for what he was, a complete navel-gazing charlatan. It's only in the martial arts where people think that just because they have a certain attitude towards what they're doing, it means that they know what they're doing and that's what's important. So when you see a person executing what appears to you to be perfect technique in the most hot, stress-filled situation you can imagine, like at a test or at a tournament, and he's doing it perfectly, the only reason he's doing it perfectly is because Mentally and psychologically and spiritually, he's dialed in. You've seen pictures of the late Honda Sensei shooting? Honda Ma Masakazu. His Hanare is the best in, I've ever seen. It's just such a revelation every time you see him shoot. You should go onto YouTube and just type in Honda, Honda Sensei Kudo and see what you come up with. The guy was a magician. It was perfect. It's impossible to explain how perfect it was. Uh, he's dead now, unfortunately. He had uh, pancreatic cancer, I think. And, died, you know, at least as these things go, they're very young. But so how was he able to do that so consistently, so perfectly, so well, in a situation where most of us would just fall to pieces? That's intestinal fortitude. And intestinal fortitude is the most important thing in Budo, no matter what it is you're doing. Kendo, EI, Kudo, Jo, doesn't matter. Just guts, basically. That's my opinion. And a lot of eye poking and things like that.
<laughs> because you started Kudo quite a while ago, even the world has become more globalized. How are you seeing Kudo spread internationally? And is it something that you could have predicted when you first started it in Japan? Is it going along the lines that you thought it would? I really wasn't thinking about that too much when I first started, but I think that inevitably, as Kudo spreads to non Japanese countries, it starts changing because people's attitude towards it change because they're not Japanese. It's kind of like Western food in Japan. It's vaguely recognizable as Western style food, but it doesn't taste like anything you would think of as being Western food. So I think that's inevitably going to happen here. A lot of people in America have different attitudes about what things are and what they should be. And the less knowledge you have of Japan and its traditions and the way people do things, the less Japanese it's going to become. So I think it's probably inevitable, but it'll probably wind up being something like American Judo and American. But the thing is, is that Aikido is never going to develop that kind of popularity. It's too esoteric. It's not fighting. So they're not going to be any big tournaments where you can win big prizes by beating people up. You know, the equipment's expensive. I don't see Kudo developing uh, that much popularity here in the United States. You're still doing Kudo, right? No, Hannah and I both stopped maybe five years ago. Oh, really? Well, why? Yeah. Well, when Atsuki was born, we started to have less time to go out oh, to practice. Yeah. But now with Atsuki growing up a little bit, and she's rather small, so I got her started in Kendo. So now our time is split between Iaido and Kendo. I see. Yeah, actually, that reminded me of a story. All my good stories are all kendo stories, but this is good. So I was discussing with Murakami Hanshi about my practice schedule. And I said, well, I will come here as often, I'll come to practice as best I can, depending upon how much free time I have. So he just looked at me and said, free time is not something you have. Free time is something you make. In other words, as far as he was concerned, other than my work and my family, if I didn't have enough time to devote to Kudo, all that meant was that I thought something else was more important than Kudo, and I was devoting my time to that instead of to Kudo. Actually, that's very, very true. You can always find time to do what you think is important, because if you think it's important, you're going to make time to do it. If you don't think it's important, you're not going to make time to do it. And all that means is you didn't think it was important enough to make time for it. That's it. There's no other explanation for that. Something else is more important. So you decided to do that other thing. If that's the case, then stop pretending that you want to do Kudo. Do whatever else it is that you want to do. But if you want to do Kudo, do Kudo. And, and that's fine. But you simply have to recognize that and not make excuses for not having time to do something. You don't have time to do something because it's not important enough for you to do. That's mm -hmm. all. And actually, that is the most important Budo lesson I think I ever learned. There are two lessons that I learned. If you think it's important enough to do, you'll find a way to do it. If you can't find a way to do it, it means it's not important to you. And that you should recognize that and not make any, any excuse about it. Number two, perseverance is the most important thing in Buddha. Sticking to it. And the sticking to it part is what teaches you spiritual training, making yourself a better person, you know, what the Japanese like to call ningen keisei, or forming the character and all, all of that. Well, then the question is, well, what character are you forming? What do you mean by becoming a better person? How does swinging a sword around or shooting arrows at things, how is that going to make you a better person? Like, what do you mean by that? It, it, in the beginning, I just sort of accepted it. Well, okay, spiritual training. I'm training to be a better person. But the question is, well, what's your definition of a better person? Nobody ever explained that, and to be perfectly honest with you, I really don't know what it means. But one thing I do know is that the, the very act of sticking with something and not giving up is precisely the thing. That's the training. It's not the getting good at it. It's the sticking to it and never giving up. That's the important thing. If there's anything in Budo that teaches you how to be a quote-unquote better person, that's what it is. There's nothing inherent in the thing itself that makes it better or worse than anything else at all. It's how you do it. And if you do it with ulterior motives, you're always going to fail. But if you simply keep at it and never give up on it, you will learn something about yourself. 
And if Udo has any meaning, I think that that's where it is, actually. Great. Cool. Well, thank you for taking this time and for I letting me. I, I hope I gave you what you wanted. Yeah, it was. This kind of thing is not for everyone. And I think that it's a, a very a grave mistake for people to try to accommodate the feelings of Westerners who want to do this stuff by changing what they've learned or taking a different approach. I would mm -hmm. prefer not to teach anybody at all rather than do this. Because I don't care if Kudo spreads in, in America. If they're doing it wrong, it's worse than if it doesn't go anywhere. One of the Shinkage Ryu teachers, he said, for us, it's not important that our school be widely popular and we have a lot of students. What's important is that the school be properly transmitted. And I agree with that completely. I think this is probably why I have so few students, is that I just teach the way I was taught. And some people are okay with that and some people aren't. But I'm not planning on changing anything just to attract students. I think that's a grave mistake. And it's, it's one of the main things that leads to the bastardization of Pluto in the West. I also want to react to the statement. I hear this every so often, a sensei saying, yeah, I don't have that many students. And the first thing that comes to mind is that if you were still at your former dojo and you weren't an instructor, then those seven or eight students probably don't even exist because they come to you because something resonates with how you teach. And that will not be the case with that other sensei. So just by having your own dojo and having seven or eight people, you just increase the total possible amount by seven or eight students. True. So it's, it's not a little amount. It's significant just having one, if you think about that. Well, I guess that's one way of looking at it. Another thing I discovered in teaching is that um, I'm nowhere near as good as I thought I was. <laughs> You know, I mean, seriously, I mean, for all the time I put into this, I think I should be better than I am. And I'm disappointed that I'm not. The main thing I've learned through my practice with Budo is just how ordinary I am. So anyway, with regards, regards to Hana, say hello to Aski for me. Yeah. Well, it's great, okay, great. great talking to you, great catching up, um, and yeah, yeah. maybe we'll talk again soon. Yeah, take it easy. Thank you. Okay. See you. Okay, bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting interviews and resources to help you explore the world of martial arts. To get the latest on what we're up to at Tokushikai Canada, subscribe to our newsletter at subscribe.tokushikai.ca and find us on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada. Until next time, thanks for listening.